All right. So today's topic is Bitcoin. Actually, this is a series of talks about cryptocurrencies. First, I will talk about Bitcoin and I divided the talk into six parts. I will talk about fundamentals of Bitcoin, the specifications, then Bitcoin blocks, wallets, transactions, forks and mining. So after that, in the next couple of slides, I will move on to Ethereum and other alternative coins. And we will talk about what are the differences and why we have other coins and so on. But in order to understand cryptocurrencies, first we have to understand Bitcoin because this is the first cryptocurrency that we have. And most of the following alternative cryptocurrencies actually take some part from the Bitcoin, uses its source codes and so on. So first we have to understand how Bitcoin works. All right, so let's recall what the blockchain technology was. Recall that blockchains are temper evident and temper resistant digital ledgers implemented in a distributed fashion and usually without the central authority. So in cryptocurrencies, we don't have a central authority most of the time, but some cryptocurrencies actually developed by some people and they always uh, take the uh, decisions themselves and you know then apply them so there may be some uh, currencies cryptocurrencies where there is a central authority but bitcoin does not have a central authority and there we will talk about why the developers actually don't have that much of power we, when we talk about segwit soft fork i will t show you why developers actually don't uh, have the final saying in Bitcoin. So blockchain actually enables the community of users to record transactions in a shared ledger. No transaction can be changed once published because once you want to modify it, you actually uh, record a new transaction which actually uh, transfers the ownership of the previous one and so on. In 2008, the blockchain idea was combined with several other technologies to create modern cryptocurrencies. The first such blockchain-based cryptocurrency was Bitcoin. So this is why we are going to talk about Bitcoin today. So within the Bitcoin blockchain, information representing electronic cash is attached to a digital address, which actually we generate from a point on an elliptic curve, right? Recall that. And we will actually re-talk uh, re about them in the following slides. Bitcoin users can digitally sign and transfer rights to that information to another user. And the Bitcoin blockchain records this transfer publicly, allowing all participants of the network to independently verify the validity of the transactions. Actually, you transfer the ownership by signing. So you use a digital signature and everybody can verify using your public key. That is the whole idea. The Bitcoin blockchain is stored, maintained and collaboratively managed by a distributed group of participants. You can also be a full node by downloading the Bitcoin core uh, software. You cannot actually use it on your mobile phone because now you have to download around 390 gigabytes of data. Because since the beginning in 2009 to this day, all of the transactions we have written to the Bitcoin blockchain exceeded 380 gigabytes. So you can be a full node, but you have to use that amount of your hard drive on your computer, okay? So if you use a, a wallet software or a, a Bitcoin software on your mobile phone, you are actually not a full node. So you don't own a, a copy of the blockchain. So you actually trust some other people when you work with those applications, okay? This is important. This along with certain cryptographic mechanisms makes the blockchain resilient to attempts to alter the ledger later. So, and this actually comes from hash functions, which we have already discussed about. So the uh, resistance comes from the uh, integrity comes from the uh, hash functions. Okay. In Bitcoin, the blockchain enabled users to be pseudonymous. We talk about this. This means that users are anonymous, but their account identifiers are not. Additionally, all transactions are publicly visible. So we have a transparent system. We see which account transferred, which, what amount of money to whom, but we don't know which account belongs to whom in real life. But as a forensic investigator, sometimes you have to uh, recover 
which accounts belongs to whom in the real life. So for this reason, in the future, we also talk about what kind of things a forensic in, forensics investigator can do to uh, obtain the real identity of the users. Okay. This has effectively enabled Bitcoin to offer pseudo anonymity because accounts can be created without any identification or authorization process. Such processes are typically required by know your customer laws. Last week, I also mentioned this. So when, a, when you create an account, for instance, at a cryptocurrency exchange web page, due to know your customer laws, you have to prove your identity most probably by sending a photo of your ID and taking a selfie with the ID card next to your face and so on. And recently, the European Union passed a law which also wanted that kind of identification check for the software where people uh, just create uh, cryptocurrency accounts. Like, you know, for Ethereum, we have popular uh, applications like MetaMask or something. So in those applications, you just download it and create an account and you get a public uh, ID, right? So you create uh, private and public keys, which allows you to, you know, have an account and, you know, you can buy NFTs, transfer money and so on. Normally, this kind of uh, process was not covered by know your customer laws. But European Union now forcing this kind of applications to know their customers. And this is a hard uh, uh, recent topic because actually you are not a customer when you just download MetaMask and create an account, right? But now if you are a European Union citizen, maybe you have to you know, provide your ID information to this kind of applications. So we will see what happens in the following months because this law just passed. I don't know how they will apply it. Since Bitcoin was pseudonymous, it was essential to have a mechanism to create trust in an environment where users could not be easily identified. Okay, and at the end, at the end of this semester, we also we will also talk about uh, zero knowledge proofs, where this pseudo anonymity actually turned into anonymity. So there are some cryptocurrencies where actually the uh, when you look at the uh, blockchain, you don't you cannot see which account sends which what amount of money to whom okay so uh, we will talk about it at the end the use of a blockchain enabled bitcoin to be implemented in a distributed fashion such that no single user controlled the electronic cash and no single point of failure existed this promoted its use but actually in the beginning since 2009 to 2012 it didn't re receive much attention but it became uh, more easy to be accessible by everybody and due to you know a huge increase and decrease in the prices there were too many news so people got uh, interested and this is why recently almost everybody knows what the bitcoin is okay its primary benefit was to enable direct transactions between users without the need for a trusted third party so this is really happens actually if you read the white paper the main idea is that in order to transfer a small amount of money, you don't need to actually third party, right? So for instance, in real life, if a person is next to you, you can just give them a small amount of cash, right? But now you cannot do it from distance. For instance, you cannot send that amount of money to some friend in Europe. So actually Bitcoin's main idea was to do that without paying much of a fee, you should be able to send, for instance, just $5 amount of Bitcoin by just paying maybe a few cents of transaction fees. So that was the initial dream. So actually it succeeded, but now the price has really increased. Now, if you want to pay, for instance, uh, your pizza with Bitcoin, in order to pay $5, maybe you have to pay $20 fee, right? So now the fees are larger. Okay, we will talk about them. So it also enabled the issuance of a new cryptocurrency in a defined manner to those users who manage to publish new blocks and maintain copies of the ledger. Such users are called miners in Bitcoin. We will also talk about mining in Bitcoin. In the beginning, you could mine with your CPU because it was in 2009, right? Then people start using GPUs. For a brief amount, people use FPGAs, but then if when you burn the FPGA into silicon, you obtain a dedicated device, which we refer to as ASICs. 
today people mine Bitcoin with ASIC. So you cannot use your CPUs or GPUs to uh, mine Bitcoin. If you do, you know, you wouldn't earn anything, but you will pay a lot of electricity, money for the electricity. The automated payment of the miners enables distributed administration of the system without the need to organize. Actually, this is very important. So this is what economists couldn't understand at the beginning. Okay. In 2009 to 2015, we tried to explain that Bitcoin is not a scam. This really works. There is a cryptography behind it, and it is really achieves what it promises. And economists think that there cannot be such thing without a trusted third party. So for a very long time, they always claim that this is a scam. They said that somebody will one day turn, uh, you know, remove all the money from the system and so on. So they couldn't understand that it really works. So go back to 2015, watch all YouTube videos. All of the economists say that this cannot be done. But today, those people actually give you investment advice on YouTube. Okay, now they believe that it really works. So this is the main thing because at that time, they ask us why this works. We try to convince them. So when I try to talk about how the cryptography behind it works, they realize that they have to learn a lot of things to understand how an elliptic curve digital signature algorithm works. So instead of learning those things, economists said that it cannot work. Okay, so this is why uh, there are a lot of announcements, tweets, YouTube videos saying that this idea cannot be used in practice. But as you can see today, a lot of people are using it. By using a blockchain and a consensus-based maintenance, a self-policing mechanism was created that ensured that only valid transactions and blocks were added to the blockchain. So this was the whole idea. I also mentioned that uh, due to the success of cryptocurrencies, the word crypto is now used for cryptocurrencies. You know, this recent news about, you know, due to a sponsorship agreement, they named the RNS crypto.com. But when you just Google crypto, 10 years ago, you would, the first result will be the yearly crypto conference named Crypto at Santa Barbara. Now you cannot find it when you search crypto. So, but crypto actually is a short for cryptography. Some people try to, you know, come up with a solution by using crypto for cryptocurrencies and removing all, they use crypt for cryptography, which complicated things more. So actually just cryptographers angry that when you, people say crypto, they mean cryptocurrency, okay? Just know that. Okay, so let's start with the basics. It was proposed by Satoshi Nakamoto and we don't know who he or she is. Idea was to have a decentralized system. Every node in the network keeps a copy of the ledger. So think about the bank, instead of only bank keeping the ledger now, you publicly distribute to everyone. Since you make it publicly available, all accounts and transactions become public, so there are no encryption. Okay, this was a surprise for everybody. Integrity of ledgers uh, are provided by cryptographic hash functions. Prevention of double spending was a huge problem in uh, electronic cash, so this was solved by hash puzzles. Again, here we use cryptographic hash puzzles, uh, functions. And to send Bitcoins, a transaction is authorized. Actually, you're not sending it, you are changing the ownership of it. So you own it by signing a digital signature, you are transferring that ownership to somebody else. Actually, when you do that, you are saying that somebody with this public key can claim this digital cash. That is what you actually do when you make a transaction, okay? And pseudo-anonymity account numbers are cryptographically obtained values and do not contain personal information. So as you can see, this, is, this was one of my introductory slides. I said that there is cryptography involved in cryptocurrencies, but not as encryption, but they appear as cryptographic hash functions and digital signatures. But nowadays, of course, we have other uh, cryptographic algorithms like uh, zero knowledge proofs, post-quantum cryptography algorithms or lightweight cryptography algorithms, which are currently useful for blockchains. And we will talk them later about them later. So Bitcoin is the first implementation of a concept called cryptocurrency, which was first described in 1998 by Wade Dye on the cypherpunks mailing list, suggesting the idea of a new form of money that uses cryptography to control discretion and transactions rather than a central authority. So cypherpunks, 
actually kind of a community which wants to use cryptographic algorithms to provide more anonymity to civilians actually because they think that we are giving too much information to companies to governments so they say that maybe we can use cryptography more and obtain more anonymity so uh, actually bitcoin is one of the latest ideas from this kind of people the first bitcoin specification and proof of concept was published in 2009 in a cryptography mailing list by satoshi nakamoto by the way the cypherpunks this is i mentioned them because in turkey people think that anarchists actually found this idea but or supported bitcoin but that's probably due to a translation error uh, it is not the work of anarchists okay satoshi left the project in late 2010 without revealing much much about himself he said that he's going to focus on other projects and he disappeared and left the codes to the other developers. So they keep maintaining the codes. So he started the process and then left. So this is why we don't know much about. It. The community has since grown exponentially with many developers working on Bitcoin. The Bitcoin protocol and software are published openly and any developer around the world can review the code or make their own modified version of the Bitcoin software. And actually, if you want to create a new cryptocurrency, you just go to Bitcoin software and make the necessary changes that you want in your cryptocurrency and you create your new cryptocurrency. That is the easiest way to do it, okay? Instead of programming everything from the scratch, you can simply take the Bitcoin software, which uh, already comes with you know, digital signatures, hash functions, and so on. You don't have to implement those cryptographic algorithms by yourself. So, Always people ask then who controls the Bitcoin network because you know some people uh, provide updates to the Bitcoin, right? So some people think that developers actually control them, but actually nobody owns the Bitcoin network, much like no one owns the technology behind email, right? So this is important because this economists couldn't understand it. So they thought that Satoshi might one day might come and you know take all over your Bitcoins. Bitcoin is controlled by all Bitcoin users around the world. While developers are improving the software, they can't force a change in the Bitcoin protocol because all users are free to choose what software and version they use. So here, when I talk about softworks, I will talk about SegWit, one of the biggest uh, softworks, uh, the first biggest software that uh, Bitcoin did. And it took like a few years to convince everybody to update their software because initially they rejected this update. So the project came into life a few years later than the initially planned. Okay. In order to stay compatible with each other, all users need to use software complying with the same rules. So if there's an update and if most of the people update their software and if you don't, then you know you cannot communicate with them. That is one of the ideas behind this uh, soft forks and hard forks. Bitcoin can only work correctly with a complete consensus among all users. Therefore, all users and developers have a strong incentive to protect this consensus. This is one of the reasons why it works because people who already invested a lot on the system, if they have a, a method to break the system, they wouldn't do it because they don't have an incentive. They already have a lot of money involved, right? So this is one of the reasons why actually Bitcoin still works. Uh, when we talk about 51% of the attacks, 51% attacks, uh, this is one of the main reasons behind it. Somebody who owns the huge amount of mining power wouldn't try to break Bitcoin because if they do, they will be the biggest losers at the end. So how does Bitcoin work? Behind the scenes, the Bitcoin network is sharing a public ledger called the blockchain. This ledger contains every transaction ever processed, allowing a user's computer to verify the validity of each transaction, where you use elliptic or digital signatures. The authenticity of each transaction is protected by digital signatures corresponding to the sending addresses, allowing all users to have full control over sending Bitcoins from their own Bitcoin addresses. In addition, 
anyone can process transactions using the computer power of specialized hardware and earn a reward reward in bitcoins for this service okay so this is actually called as mining so in most of the cryptocurrencies you have mining because uh, the consensus algorithm is proof of work like in ethereum or bitcoin you have to perform some kind of computational uh, processes so that you solve a, a hash puzzle and obtain award at the end so this is what we call a mining but this is not always the case we already talked about consensus models in the previous week uh, especially in permissioned blockchains you don't have to do mining at all because only authorized people can uh, publish a block and since they're authorized they don't have to do any mining at all because we already trust them in some way okay but in bitcoin and in almost all of the cryptocurrencies we have mining some of them uses proof of stake systems and we already talked about them last week okay so scalability is a very important problem and we will talk about them today a lot can bitcoin scale to become a major payment network so this is an important question again people don't understand so those economists who didn't understand bitcoin in 2010 now they're saying that in the future we will be using bitcoin as a payment system instead of currencies like dollars or uh, euros and so on but this cannot work in this state okay currently a transaction in bitcoin blockchain takes approximately 10 minutes to be included in the blockchain so think about paying at the supermarket with Bitcoin. So you have to wait 10 minutes to see that it is really included in the blockchain. But then we have to think about maybe there is a conflict and maybe there is another blockchain with the same height. So maybe they are competing. Maybe in that blockchain, your uh, payment is not included. In order to be sure that you really paid for it, the suggestion is that to wait for six blocks, which means 60 minutes one hour think about paying at the supermarket and then wait for one hour next to the cashier and see that it really works okay with this state you cannot use bitcoin as a daily payment this is one of the reasons the time but also we have to check how many bitcoin payments we can perform in a single second right it is important because if there is a limit then if the whole world starts to use it as for a major payment then it would be you know a problem so let's read the slides and talk about it again later the bitcoin network can already process a process a high sorry a much higher number of transactions per second than it does today it is however not entirely ready to scale to the level of major credit card networks work is underway to lift current limitations and future requirements are well known since inception Every aspect of the Bitcoin network has been in a continuous process of maturization, optimization, and specialization, and it should be expected to remain that way for some years to come. So in other words, in the future, maybe we can modify the Bitcoin so that it, is, it can turn into a major payment network, but not today. As traffic grows, more Bitcoin users may use lightweight clients and full network nodes may become a more specialized service. So let me show you figure which i took from blockchain.com which actually shows you how many transactions are performed in each block okay so this graph is actually showing you for the last one year and this is a seven day average graph so as you can see in the best case or the most transactions blocks uh, you can see that 2400 transactions included in a block so a block you know created in 10 minutes so this means that in the whole world only 2400 people could use bitcoin as a payment in the in the 10 minutes so if you divide it into you know 10 minutes you can then calculate how many transactions we can do in a second so we will do it in the next slide but as you can see in some days or you know weeks of the month there is a huge demand and sometimes people use less so there are less amount of transactions included in the 
blockchain blocks. So you can visit the web page and see a more recent uh, graph. I took this probably last week, but uh, the picture is similar generally. So as you can see, there are around 2000 transactions included in the block. So let's look at the scalability today. So Bitcoin block size is set to one megabyte. So this is written in stone. So Satoshi chose this, so we have to use it. But in the SegWit soft fork, this actually theoretically improved to four megabytes. So I will talk about this in the soft forks uh, when we talk about them. But now you can think that if you use uh, SegWit uh, addresses, you don't have to put the digital signature inside the transaction, but you put it at the end. So this way you are actually not uh, including it in this one megabyte part. So this is why it X is one megabyte. So you're actually kind of a cheating with the software here. And average Bitcoin transaction size is around 380 bytes. If you perform, you know, pay to public key hash kind of transaction. So actually your size of transaction determines how many transactions we can include in a block, right? Because we are limited with one megabyte. Actually, with this, if you everybody uses SegWit transactions, we yeah, kind of a, theoretically have a four megabytes block, but we will focus on one megabyte. So if every transaction is around 380 bytes, this means that you know one megabyte is this many bytes. If you multiply 1024 and 1024, you obtain this number, which is two to the 20 actually. So if you divide it with the size of the bytes of average transaction, this means that number of transactions per block is around 2,760, the maximum. So as you can see, this number is not achieved in the picture, but we came very close to it. So this calculation is somewhat accurate, okay? So in kind of a best way, you can have around 2,800 transactions included in a block. But we said that a block is generated in around 10 minutes, which is 600 seconds. So if you divide this number with 600 seconds, this means that Bitcoin can guarantee around 4.6 transactions per second, okay? So think about using it as a major payment system. Then think about credit cards. Visa does around 1,700 transactions per second on average an average of 150 million transactions every day. And this is not the upper bound. This is what we see today. Probably Visa can handle a lot more, okay? So this is why we cannot see Bitcoin as a alternative to credit cards, okay? You have to focus on this. So this actually creates the scalability problem. So people say that, okay, instead of uh, limiting ourselves to one megabyte, let's make a hard fork and say that now the block size is 32 megabytes, right? So this means that you can multiply this number with 32, also this one with 32. So I think at the end you get around 160, right? Still not as high as Visa, but 32 times larger than this number, right? So people really insisting on having a hard fork. And some people did and created an another cryptocurrency called Bitcoin Cash, and we will talk about them in the fork section. But without creating a hard fork, uh, actually SegWit upgrade was a good way to, you know, theoretically upgrading this to four megabytes. So actually this upper bound is now higher if you use SegWit transactions, okay? But still it cannot compete with this number, but again, this is also known by Bitcoin developers. So in every update, actually, they are modifying this by using soft forks. They are reducing the average transaction sizes and so on. So they are actually allowing more transactions in a block with each of these upgrades. So in the future, maybe if I teach this course 10 years later, these numbers will be completely different. Okay, we will see what happens. So I will keep always these slides and add the new ones to the end to see how, we, uh, how things are changed. So I will keep the slides like a blockchain. I wouldn't, I will not update them. I will add new slides. Okay. 
So if developers can change things, so question is, can I do the same? And the answer is yes. So if you want to add a new property to Bitcoin, you can just create a Bitcoin improvement proposal, shortened as BIP. So anybody can recommend adjustments, improvements, and additions to the Bitcoin environment. So this is actually how we have uh, soft forks or new patches and so on. They are called Bitcoin Improvement Proposals, BIPs. BIPs became active when the entire community gives mutual consent by adopting the proposal. Okay, some BIPs are rejected because some BIPs propose like hard forks or things, they propose things that, which will complicate things and they are rejected, but some of them are uh, approved. And so this is why we had the SegWit upgrade and also five or six months ago in November 2021, we had the Taproot upgrade, which added a few more uh, properties to Bitcoin and also included Schnorr signatures. This is why we actually covered that. So you can review all of the BIPs at this web page. I don't know which one is the official one, but this works right now. But of course, maybe in the future, this link will not work. So, you know, just Google BIPs and you can also find the GitHub pages, but also, you know, all of the list on the web. So let's talk about uh, what kind of cryptographic hash functions uh, Bitcoin uses and finish this part. So I recall that we talk about hash functions and we said that in a blockchain, hash functions can be used for address derivation, securing the block header, securing block data, creating unique identifiers, creating cryptographic puzzles. So. For this reason, you have to choose one or more cryptographic hash functions for your blockchain. So I gave this list, which is important because some of the hash functions are broken. They are not collision resistant. Some of them are not premise resistant and so on, or second premise resistant. And in order to have full security, we really require uh, all of these resistances like pre-image, second pre-image and collision resistance. So we don't recommend using SHA-1, which is broken. So for this reason, uh, we prefer RIPMD 160 because it provides short hashes compared to SHA-256 or SHA-356. And Bitcoin Secret allows the use of SHA-1, RIPMD 160 and SHA-256, okay? SHA-3 is not included because Bitcoin is developed way before SHA-3 is selected and the developers didn't see any reason to include it in the code. Maybe in the future, we will say that SHA-3 is also supported. Currently, we don't need it, but why not? Okay, so Bitcoin choice of cryptographic algorithms are as follows, these three. We don't use SHA-1, but you can, since uh, we talk about pay to script hash, in your script, you can use SHA-1. Actually, there is a very nice script, uh, which actually transfers money to this script. So anybody who wants, who funds the SHA-1 collision can withdraw the money from that account. So it was a very nice challenge and it was solved. So I will talk about when we talk about transactions. So you can use SHA-1 in Bitcoin if you want, but we don't recommend it. For the digital signatures, uh, Satoshi only included elliptic curve digital signature algorithms. And at that time, Schnorr signatures was also available. And people always uh, like the Schnorr signature more because they can be aggregated and so on. But Satoshi didn't use it because the pa patent for Schnorr signatures expired in 2008 when Satoshi was developing Bitcoin. So he could use it, the patent was expired. But since there, it was patented for a very long time, not much people used it. So we couldn't be sure that it, is, it was secure, but a lot of people use elliptic curve digital signatures, governments and so on. So there was a trust in the elliptic curve digital signature algorithm. So this is why Satoshi chose elliptic curve digital signature algorithm. But now that we have Schnorr signatures and it allows key aggregation, this is why just a few months ago with the, this BIP 340 uh, people, Bitcoin developers include the Schnorr signatures and everybody, all of the miners accepted this uh, soft fork so that we now have Schnorr signatures. So this actually allows key aggregation. So in multi-signatures, 
we can have very uh, small transaction sizes, which actually also allows us to include more transactions in a block. Okay, so it also provides some kind of anonymity because key aggregated accounts also start with one as if it is it belongs to a single user. So this way, people looking at the uh, web pages like Blockchain Explorer or so on, they would not understand if it is a multi-signature or a single signature just by looking at the wallet address. In the previous times, we could easily detect it because uh, regular transactions start with a wallet address of one, but people who use, you know, pay to script hash or something, it will start with three and we would notice that maybe it is a multi-signature algorithm and so on. Okay. So, uh, since we chose elliptic curve digital signature algorithm, we have to fix an elliptic curve and everybody use that elliptic curve. Okay. So Satoshi did a clever thing. He chose a very good elliptic curve and which is not also a NIST standard because uh, a lot of people does not trust uh, NSA and people think that they are always weakening the uh, standards. So instead of choosing a NIST standard elliptic curve, Satoshi chose a curve that is not a NIST standard. This is, by the way, a misconception. A lot of people think that it is a NIST approved curve, but it is not, okay? So you can visit this link. You can see the list of elliptic curves. And this one, you will see that in the document is not a NIST curve. But I talked to some people at NIST. So for interoperability, they are planning to include this elliptic curve, SEGP256K1, in the future documentation. So maybe this year on, or the following year, we will see that NIST also will add it probably to the appendix or something, saying that many cryptocurrencies are using this. Since Bitcoin uses this, Ethereum also uses it because there's a trust involved in this one already. So when people developed Ethereum, they also chose this elliptic curve and almost every other cryptocurrency who copies the Bitcoin's uh, source code also uses this elliptic curve. So it is a very simple curve, which is defined by y square equals to x cubed plus seven and defined over fp, where p is a prime number and it can be calculated from this equation. Okay. But if you write it in hexadecimal, it becomes this. So all points on this curve are valid Bitcoin public keys, but actually we already work a lot on elliptic curves. We know what the generator point is. So they chose a base point, G. And from G, you can generate this many elements on this many points on the curve. So actually, not every point actually on this curve is a valid public key, but points that can be generated by G is actually a valid Bitcoin address. So maybe it might be a good idea to check if a given wallet is actually generated by this G, which is not a very hard thing to do, okay? So here we said that this is the base point, base point G. Here you can see that 04 in hexadecimal. This actually says that we are representing the elliptic curve point in an uncompressed form. This means that if you divide this hexadecimal into two, first part will be your X coordinate, the second part will be your uh, y coordinate. Okay, so there are different ways to represent it. If you put two or three here, it will be saying that this is a compressed version. So in those scenarios, you only put the x coordinates, and we recover the y coordinate from the equation of the curve from here. Okay, putting two or three actually tells you which part of the y coordinate you are going to use. If I'm not mistaken, when it is two, the y coordinate is odd. When it is three y coordinate is even or the vice versa, but it actually tells you which point to use, okay? So this is the choices that we have for uh, Bitcoin and the cryptographic algorithms chosen by the Satoshi and only Schnorr signatures are added so far, but maybe in the future, we will see more cryptographic algorithms included in this uh, blockchain. But if you put a new cryptographic algorithm, you have to introduce a soft fork, okay?